joining us online. Glad you're with us uh, via radio. Uh, real quick, um, house announcement. Next weekend, I start a brand new series I'm super excited about called Reassembly Required. And here's the whole idea. Relationships, I don't have to tell you this, are really hard. Uh, repairing relationships are even harder. And so for three weeks, we're going to talk about um, how to do that because we want to help. But with this in mind, every relationship can't be repaired. Um, that's just the reality of it. We're gonna, but we're going to talk about what does it look like to do all that you can do so you can walk away with no regrets. And here's just the reality. If you don't have a relationship that needs repaired now, you will at some point. And so the next three weeks, and this is every relationship. It could be a uh, romantic relationship, work. It could be crazy, a mother-in-law uh, that you should make eye contact with right now if she's with you. It could be any, I mean, so this is a lot of relationships. So this is very general. It's a great time to invite, maybe not a great time to invite somebody you have relational conflict with, because uh, that could get awkward, but it's a great time to invite. And here's the thing, I think you guys maybe underestimate this sometimes, but I just can't stress enough. Like the cat, this invite could be the catalyst for not just a repaired relationship in terms of, you know, what's going on in their life. It could lead to a repaired relationship, a renewed relationship with Jesus, with the church after somebody's walked away for a decade. And one of the things we hear all the time is that when somebody invites and then they have somebody show up, they in that moment feel a part of this movement and a part of this gathering and mission in a way that nothing else can, can match. And that's a big deal because you are a part of this if you call Center Point home. So invite, be here next week, reassembly required. Um, but this week, we're laying in the plane on the series called Living With Yourself. And here's where I wanna start. I want you to think about your favorite person. And here's what I mean by this, because that could actually, there could be a lot of different descriptors for your favorite person. But I mean the person that has had the biggest positive impact on your life. In fact, some of you would say, like this person has changed the trajectory of your life. They've influenced you in a positive way in massive ways, um, but who is that person for you? And here's what I know, even without knowing them, is generally they have several things in common. And one of the things is anytime you hear somebody tell a story about somebody who's impacted their life in a significant way, their life was not consumed with them. Just mark it down. I'm talking about the person who's made an incredibly positive impact. They weren't about themselves. And in fact, in a lot of cases, the more that they pursued humility, which is humility is making other people feel important by what you say and what you do, the more they pursued humility, in some ways, the bigger they became, not smaller. In a lot of cases, you don't remember, isn't this true, like what they said or what they say if they're still in your life. But man, you remember how they made you feel? In a lot of cases, this type of person or relationship, like they, it wasn't about what they had, it wasn't about what they had acquired, but it was about how they lived and the fact that they lived generously and it influenced and impacted your life in a massive way. And these are those people, if you're thinking about them right now, where rather than how a lot of our culture works, the closer you get to them, the better they look, not worse. Like these are the people that the, the closer you get to them, the more authentic they become. And here's what I tell you, and I'll talk about what this means in a minute. They figured out a way how to not live their life like this. They figured out how to live life and do relationships and make decisions and organize priorities by living like this. And for a lot of people, there's somebody that comes to your mind. They shaped your life. They changed the trajectory of your life. They've influenced your parenting, influenced your marriage, maybe influenced some of the decisions that you've made career-wise, but they had a massive impact on you. So we'll come back to that in a second. Um, we're in part four of living with yourself. And just real quick, catching you up if you haven't been here, the whole series is about making sure that the self that you live with is the self that other people see, the self that you intended to be. And what we've said throughout the series is everybody has a story of looking at the outside and somebody melts down, everything goes off the rails, they're living a double life, they're harboring a secret, they're lying to the people who love them and depend on them. And then it hits the fan, everything comes out. And without judgment, a lot of times, you look at it from the outside and you go, how in the world could they live with themselves? Like, how could they keep showing up to dinner? How, how could they continue to, to like stand on that stage with what they're, what they're hiding? How could they continue to act like nothing's wrong and hide behind the facade? And our implication is with my integrity or my character, I just couldn't live with myself. There's no way I could go on. There's no way that I could continue to live that double life without melting down, without my conscience just being crushed under the weight of that. But here's what we've said in the series. It's so important. You could live with yourself. You maybe couldn't, as we've said, live with your present self, but your present self may be miles away from your future self. In fact, your future self could be somebody if left unattended that you wouldn't even recognize. 
And the reason this is a big deal in the series is because as we've said, the health of your soul will determine your capacity for duplicity. And soul is just mind, emotions, will, dreams, desires. The health of your soul determines your capacity for duplicity. Duplicity is like you live one way on the inside, you're another way on the outside. And the, the capacity you have for this is really determined by the health of your soul. The health of your soul determines whether the gap in your life can grow between who you actually are and maybe who you pretend to be, who you pretend to be on social media, who you pretend to be to your coworkers, who you're trying to convince somebody you know, else in your life that you've got it all together. The health of your soul determines how wide that gap can grow before you either close the gap and go, I'm not gonna live like this anymore, or you just manage the gap. And so in this series, our whole goal is, how, how do you do that? How do you ensure that you don't end up there? Because I mean, again, this is such a big deal. One of the big reasons I am convinced that people end up in situations like that is because they don't think they can end up in situations like that. And what we said in the series is it is possible that you could eventually become somebody that if you were to meet them today, you would despise them. You could become that person. So how do you ensure that that doesn't happen? How do you safeguard your soul for the future? How do you make sure that you don't become a future self that you wouldn't even like? How do you make sure that the that duplicity doesn't destroy and kill you? And so we're looking at four habits that we started with week one, surrender your will. Week two, monitor your heart. Last week, decide who you are. And then this week, I wanna look at the fourth habit of how you safeguard your soul. How do you ensure that the self that you're living with is the self that you wanna be and the self that God has intended you to be? Now, to get there, I wanna come around this idea first. And this is kind of, uh, this is true of all of us. So if you're investigating faith, not sure about Jesus, which we have a lot of those people in the house and online, this is just true of human beings. But here's where I wanna start to set up um, this fourth habit. The thing that is true about all of us is that we all desire someone's applause. And this is just a human thing. It's not bad. In fact, God put that in you. God created you for that. That's just who you are. And it's, it's everything, everybody in the human race is there. But we, we all desire applause. We all are hardwired to want attention, to want approval, to want affirmation, to want love, to want, I mean, all of those things. And in fact, you see this at the earliest age. So you've watched other kids do this or if you're a parent, um, you remember the dynamic, um, if you've seen it or you're parenting a kid when they're like three years old or two years old and they do something like for me, it's like, hey, daddy, watch this, watch this. Hey, daddy, watch, hey, daddy, watch, hey, daddy, watch. And at two, they, you gotta watch the same thing. 400 times. And it's like, you just jumped off of one step to another step that was seven inches high. I've seen this 400 times. What? I, move on to something else. I, mean, I don't ever tell them that, but that's like, that's what you're thinking. Hey, daddy, watch this. Daddy, I've daddy seen it so many times that I don't want to see it anymore. But that's the nature of like approval and affirmation, right? Because your bucket always leaks. I mean, it's true with your kids, man. There's not a point where like, okay, top it off, we're good. I mean, your kid just needs more 15 minutes later, right? They wanna show you another whatever, they wanna you know, watch this, and it, but it's true of all of us, whether you're three or 53 or 83. And the thing about like this desire for approval, I've talked to you guys about this a lot, but it's actually an appetite. And if you've heard me say this before, just go with me for 20 seconds, but an appetite encompasses a lot of things. It's not just food. It encompasses your desire for pleasure, your desire for recognition, your uh, desire to pursue things, to earn things, to achieve things. All of those things are an appetite. And again, they're not wrong, but good appetites can be distorted. And the thing about appetites is appetites, just like your appetite for food, is never fully and finally satisfied. Like you don't get to a place to go, I'm good. It always eventually wants more. And in fact, the more you feed it, especially around certain content, Text, the more that it wants, the more that it gets, the more that it wants more. That's just the nature of appetites. And the same is true for your desire for affirmation and respect and attention and achievement. And after a while, that desire, that appetite, as it begins to grow, suddenly leads you to, to a place where there's certain things in your life you just become accustomed to. You become entitled to them. You become dependent on them. And all of a sudden, that thing that you have, that thing that you earn, that thing that you achieve, that thing that you're kind of used to, all of a sudden, you just become entitled to that. You become dependent on that. And most of the time for us as, you know, as adults, that we're unaware of it until we don't get our usual share. We, we don't get what we're used to. We get passed by. We get excluded. They're not praising us any longer. But we're unaware until we don't get our... our 
our normal share. And then we start to feel like, and this is just human nature, we start to feel like something's just kind of slipping away from us, that we're losing something, that something that we achieved or that we had or that we earned is, is kind of drifting away. And this could be a ton of things. This could be like, well, they didn't invite me this time. This could be, I've sat on the bench the entire year. Are you kidding me? I'm way better than these guys. This could be, I'm not, I'm not brought into the ideations any longer, so they not value my opinion. Do they not value my insight? This is like, you know, they're dating somebody else. He didn't say he loved me. They didn't ask for my input. Like, no bonus. Are you kidding me? This is all of the no thank you, no hearts, no likes, no mentions, no shares on social media. I mean, whatever that thing is, that like I had it and now I feel like I'm losing it or they're undermining or it's being taken away. And all of a sudden there's something in your life that just feels like it's kind of slipping away from you. And in that moment, at human nature, we are tempted to cling. We're tempted to try to like go after, to fight for, to preserve, to make sure that we hold on to. But just listen to me. The moment you begin to do that, everybody around you notices the moment you begin to live your life, the way I would describe it is white knuckling, like I've got to hold on to this. I earned this. I achieved this. Why aren't they recognizing me any longer? You begin to telegraph that to other people. In fact, you have known people who live their life like this and it caused you to kind of step back from the relationship a little bit because it just makes people weird. It makes people do things they wouldn't normally do. It makes them in the fight to preserve and to hold on to. It makes them end up being intentional about things that they maybe shouldn't be intentional about any longer. And they start to close their hands trying to hold on to something. And here's what I wanna tell you, and I'll come back to this later. This is such a big deal just in terms of life. What we cling to in an unhealthy way always diminishes. Like whatever you feel like I gotta hold on to this, I gotta preserve this, I gotta keep this. Whatever you hold on to, eventually diminishes. In fact, I would say it this way. Whatever you hold on to and cling to eventually diminishes you. In some way, your life begins to get smaller. You begin to live smaller. And here's what I would tell you. The people that have impacted your life in the most significant ways, the people that had the greatest positive impact that maybe changed the trajectory of some area of your life, they somehow found a way to avoid living like this. They somehow were able to discover, I think, what a lot of people in our culture miss. And it attracted you, it influenced you. In some cases, changed your life. Actually, the, the idea around all this is reflected in a single statement from one of the most famous guys in all of the scripture. And I, I'm, I'm not overstating this. I, when I was thinking about this series, I, it was originally gonna be a week longer and I was in between two messages. I was kind of working on two outlines. And when we had to reduce it um, by a message, I was like, this is the thing out of two that I gotta talk about. And this is true about a lot of stuff I speak about, but this is incredibly important, incredibly personal to me because there's been several seasons of my life I learned, or this verse kind of hit me in a different way years ago. And then several seasons, it kind of came back to the forefront that I, I'm telling you has been one of the greatest influences in navigating certain seasons where I needed to be reminded. And it kind of was a guardrail to keep me from living like this. And I'm telling you what, and I'm gonna kind of tease it out, but what, um, you will find and what is, is kind of borne out in this passage um, around John is something that has the potential to be so liberating in your life and it has the potential to safeguard your soul and it is the way to live no matter where you're coming from in life. But to get there, I wanna give you a little bit of backstory real quick, so I'm gonna dive right in. Mark, who interviewed Peter, actually talks about this. In Mark chapter one, verse four, it says, John the Baptist, who even if you haven't been around the church, you probably know about him, appeared in the wilderness, basically middle of the desert in the Middle East, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now, just real quick. This, this, we just go on by this. This right here in the first century was unbelievably offensive because here's what John is saying and I'll kind of help contextualize it for you because they already had a sophisticated forgive you of your sin system. There was a whole temple. There was all these practices, all these rules. You brought bulls and goats. They had this whole thing. And in essence, what John is saying that is implied here is, I know you've got a sophisticated forgive you of your sin system. I'm just here to tell you that your sophisticated forgive you of your sin system is jacked up. It's corrupted. It's a mess. And now I am preparing the way for somebody who's gonna come and replace it. And they're not gonna replace it with a new system. They're gonna replace it with a person. Have a nice day. That's John's message. Like, you, I know you guys think that you've got it all down, but your system for how you relate to God, it's broken. And there is somebody who's gonna come, who's gonna basically 
introduce a new system that's gonna change everything. And so verse five, this is what makes this very tricky for the religious leaders in the first century because John's preaching this message and then verse five, the whole Judean countryside. And how many of the people? All the people of Jerusalem went out to him. And so all the religious leaders are like, that's a problem. Now just real quick, maybe it's hyperbole, I don't know. But even if it's hyperbole, we are talking tens of thousands of people. I mean, this is, this is a packed RJS stadium. This is whoever at Amelie Arena. This is a Taylor Swift concert. Like this is, he's a big deal. It's, I, so I don't know, maybe it's hyperbole, but you're talking tens of thousands of people risking their life. We don't ever think about that. Going through the desert, gathering you know, on the riverbank and listening to John, whose popularity is through the roof. And it creates this massive, massive tension with religious leaders because religious leaders in the first century, um, it wasn't just about religion. They had melded it with politics. And so it was this whole political balance of power issue, not unlike much of the church in 2024, but um, if it's off the rails. So this whole thing was political. And generally when somebody claimed to be a Messiah, which is what they were afraid of with John, it led to a whole political balance of power. Generally there would be civil unrest and there would be bloodshed. It was a big deal. And so basically they wondered, John, are you saying you're a Messiah? Are you claiming to be a Messiah? Because if you are, we're gonna have a problem because it's gonna mess with our politics. And so all of these religious leaders send their little minions out to the Jordan River and they investigate what's happening with John and what he is preaching. And so they just straight up after the big, you know, after the big meeting, they just get John aside and like, John, we just got one question for you. Who are you? And John responds to them, hey, I'm not who you think I am. I'm not the Messiah. I know that's why you came. I know that's why you sent your little investigators out here. I'm not the guy. In fact, I'm just the warm up act. I'm the garage band before the main show. I'm pointing to somebody who's bigger, who is greater, who's gonna change everything. And I'm telling you, if you think these crowds are big, wait for the guy that I'm pointing to. And so verse seven, after me, this is how John kind of responds to their question, comes the one more powerful than I. The straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie, meaning I'm not even in this guy's league. I'm not even in this guy's category. And I'm just telling you, if you think this is a big show, watch what this guy is about to do. And so then John says, uh, John 129 in his gospel, the next day John saw Jesus. And this is such an important moment. This isn't even the verse I'm getting to, but this is such an important moment. One of my favorite passages in all the scripture. When John saw Jesus coming toward him, he said to him, what? I just wanna, yeah, maybe I made that complicated. I don't know. I just wanna make sure that you were with me and apparently you weren't. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and he said, what? Look. Yeah, you didn't need to finish it, but that's fine. That's, you know, overachieve. Kind of wanted to tease out the second part of the verse, but whatever. Um, this is such a big deal because all these people gather, there's thousands of people and I'm telling you, they, there's no way they could have known this is a moment that's gonna change history. This is a moment that multi-generationally is gonna shape everything. John sees Jesus coming down the riverbank and there's thousands gathered and he, his one word invitation is, look, look, I'm telling you, I'm not the guy. And I never claimed to be the guy. And this is a big deal and I love it. And I love that there's tens of thousands of people. Everybody's showing up. This has been fun, but I'm telling you, I'm not the person. There is one that is coming and this is the one, look. And then this incredibly powerful statement that you cannot overemphasize what this meant. Look, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And in this moment, John basically is saying the final sacrifice for the entire world is here. Like I know up until this point, you have had this sophisticated forgive you of your sin system and it's constantly going to the temple. Here's my bull, here's my goat, here's a temporary covering for my sin. God, are we cool? You have your whole checklist. God has come to replace the entire system. And now rather than a sacrifice for sin that you're gonna bring to the temple every year, there is a final sacrifice. The system is going to be expired and now it's gonna be a person and his name is Jesus. And he's standing at the riverbank. And now literal trans. He has the power to literally pick up the sin of the world and carry it off. And John believed without any hesitation 
that Jesus was who Jesus said he was and he had come to do exactly what the prophets had foretold. He was the final sacrifice, a person for the sins of the entire world. Look, not a lamb, the lamb, the final sacrifice, the entire world. Now, unfortunately, they didn't have anybody there to contextualize it like I just did for you. So they're like, what are you talking about? And so here's John's, I love this. Here's John's attempt to explain to them what I just explained to you, verse 30. This is the one I meant when I said, a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Huh? (laughs) John's like, let me run it back. Let me explain it to you. A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Like, John, you're not helping, man. You got more confusing. I think you've been in the sun too long. Like that, that doesn't help us. But then just, this, what, what starts to come next? What is unpacked? I'm telling you, this is where it becomes so incredibly relevant to you. This is where it starts to become so incredibly relevant to me. And if you're not a faith person trying to figure out the Jesus thing, I, I love that you're, I don't know what you've experienced in Jesus' name. I don't know culturally what's been done. And then, you know, somebody signed Jesus' name to it and it was reprehensible and Jesus would want nothing to do with it. And you're just trying church again. You're trying to figure it out. And I have no idea all that you have experienced and all the ways in which Christianity has been muddled up and confused for you. My hope is that eventually you would come to the place in spite of all of that to recognize that's not the Jesus of the scriptures. But even if you're not there yet or if you never get there, this is such a big deal. And this is relevant to you as well because this is just what all of us experience in life, what starts to be unpacked in this narrative. The verse 35, the next day, John was there again with his disciples. Now again, two of his disciples, John had potentially hundreds of disciples. I mean, just real quick note, again, I can't emphasize, John was the guy Like Jesus wasn't even on the scene. He was a no-name carpenter from Nazareth. Um, Like nobody knew who he was before this moment when he begins his public ministry. John was the dude. John had hundreds of disciples. Everybody looked to John. John, height of his popularity. And so the next day, there they are again. John's with his disciples. And when they saw Jesus passing by again, John said the same thing. Look, the Lamb of God, And verse 37, when the two disciples heard him say this, they did what? They followed Jesus. And you're like, that's amazing. Not for John. But you ever thought about this? They, the the two begin to follow Jesus. Within weeks and months, hundreds would leave John and to follow Jesus. So in this moment, it's incredible. We just skip on by the verse. That's amazing. So many people following Jesus. Yeah, they follow Jesus and simultaneously unfollow John. And all of John's disciples is starting to freak out. I mean, some of them are t- trying to hold on to hope. I-, I imagine they're like, hey, listen, we've heard the guy, Jesus. I don't know if you've ever heard him speak parables before. They're unbelievably confusing. It'll never catch on. So I think some are trying to encourage John, but for the rest of them, they're like, what's going on, man? You're losing followers. You're losing disciples. This guy is showing up in your territory. I mean, this is like the equivalent of they left your church and went to the other church. They left your company and they're working for the other company and you wanna be happy for them, but you're really not. This is, they're dating this other guy. I mean, whatever, whatever the scenario is, this is what John's experience, it's just real life. They follow Jesus and in the men, meantime, they unfollow John. And in verse 26 of John 3 in his gospels, he records that they came to John and they said to him, this is, John, this is John's disciples, Rabbi, that man, we're not even gonna say his name, so ticked off. That man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one that you testified about. I mean, John, you set this guy up. I mean, you talked him up. You've given him street cred. I mean, you paved the way and look, he's baptizing. That's your gig. That's what you do. You should have trademarked that, John. You should have thought ahead. He's copying you. I mean, what the nerve of this guy to show up, not only, I mean, go to another riverbank. You show up at the very same riverbank as John and John already has the name of John the Baptist and you have the nerve to show up at his riverbank and begin to baptize and steal his followers. I mean, it's literal. I mean, you, you think I'm joking. Read the text that they're basically, hey, John, you gotta step up your game, man, because you're about to lose all of your following. Everything that you've worked hard for, all of the the hours that you spent speaking to crowds of thousands, and they're just leaving you for a guy that didn't sign a non-compete and he has taken all your business. 
And here's the thing, I, I'm telling you, what comes next is so amazing. In a lot of ways, it is so liberating because John just doesn't fall for it. And I talked to a ton of people after the first service and I just knew this is one of those messages and maybe you're not there, but by the time I get to the end of this, I think many of you will be where they were just like, that's exactly where I'm at because it's just such a human struggle. I don't care who you are. I don't care how spiritual you are. And John just doesn't fall for it. In fact, the perspective that he is about to give us is the most difficult thing to maintain and to kind of keep hold of when you feel like something is slipping away. When you feel like that something you've worked for is maybe not what it used to be, when suddenly they're not recognizing you, when suddenly you're not applauded, when suddenly it's not up and to the right the way it was last quarter. I mean, whatever the thing is, this perspective is so difficult to maintain when it feels like something that is slipping away. But I'm telling you, it is the way to live. It is the means to safeguard your soul from what has the potential to destroy you. And it is the way to live your life, not white knuckling and feeling like you control everything that comes your way in such a way that has the potential to sabotage the very things that you want out of life. To this, verse 27, John replied, just real quick before we go to the next. You you ready for this? This is such a big, this verse is such a big deal. I don't don't believe you. Are you ready for this? To this, John replied, a person can only receive what is given to them from heaven. A person, man, a woman, a teenager, whoever, a person can only receive what is given to them from heaven. I just, real quick, to just kind of ingrain this in our mind, I just want to say that together, real quick. And the, the original translation is a little bit confusing because it says what is given them from heaven. So I just say what is given to them from heaven because that's too confusing. So say this with a person can only receive what is given to them from heaven. Now here's, here's what I want you to do. And this is almost awkward to do, but I want you to just open up your hands for a second. Just go like this. Just say that with me. A person can only receive what is given to them from heaven. And here's the thing. There is nothing about that that is intuitive. There is nothing about that that is natural. And right now you may be in a place where you don't feel like you're losing and it's actually better than it's ever been. And you know, it's up and to the right and, and you don't feel this, but the moment emotionally you begin to feel this is when it gets harder, no matter how much intellectually you believe it in this moment. And yeah, I wanna live like that. But the moment you're faced with something where it feels like something is slipping away from you, you're losing something, it gets so difficult. I mean, th- this is the... This is the thing that all of us struggle with. So here's a couple questions. These are rhetorical, so don't answer them out loud, but I just, uh, get you thinking for a second. Did you choose your family? I mean, did you choose your family? Did you choose family of origin, all that came with that, negatively, positively, the layers of dysfunction, all the good stuff you got? Did you choose any of your family of origin? Did you have control over any of that? I mean, did you choose... Ultimately, like your IQ, I'll take a 140. Did you have any say in that? Did you have any say in your, you know, just what has been handed down to you DNA-wise in terms of your health, the ramifications of that, your looks? I mean, how many of your opportunities did you have no control? I know there's a lot where you can point back and draw, you know, connections of I worked hard for this and I whatever, but think about all of the opportunities you had nothing to do, you had no control over. Place of birth, context, Who was in your life? What happened when you made that move that seemed like, you know, it was an accident? That door that just happened to open up at the right time. Think of all of the things that you didn't have any hand in. Think about all of the things in your life, all of the variables that were outside of your control completely that have had a major impact on who you are. What John is saying in this moment is there is no reason or excuse for anybody to have pride about anything. But on the other side of it, there's no reason to fear either. And John would go, listen, why would I cling to any of this? I mean, why would would I cling to any of this at all? Why would I live like that? This is so personal to me because I I was taught this verse at a young age and came back to it in many different seasons. And there's probably like several other things in this series. Most series I teach are are very personal. That's part of how I do what I do is I'm dealing with this. And so I think it'll impact other people. And so this, a lot of the series, I've given you several prayers are very personal to me. 
And this verse is incredibly personal. There's probably not, and I've said this about several other messages in this series, probably not a week goes by, I don't quote this verse to myself. In some seasons, every single day. In some seasons, multiple times a day. And I'll, I won't forget about three, four years ago um, with all the stuff that just we went through culturally, one of the things that many have begun to write about, if you're in any kind of leadership, it was the most, def- I, not just my opinion, but many other um, thoughtful individuals, the most difficult season of leadership culturally in our generation. Marketplace, ministry, doesn't matter where you're in. And I remember several crossroads during that season, almost four years ago now, where just spending time in prayer, I knew as a leader, and this is part of any leader, you gotta make decisions, people are gonna be upset, that's just a part of the job, whatever. But it was a season where it was different and every decision, there was exponentially more positive and negative ramifications. There were several decisions I had to make where I just wrestled with God, where for me, where I was at, I felt like it was was an obedience to God issue. And I know you don't think I'm a normal person, some of you, um, or don't struggle with normal stuff, but I struggle with normal stuff. And I remember that season knowing that at least temporarily that those decisions would cost me and feeling the same stuff you feel. Like, what if I lose this? I've worked hard for this. Humanly perspective, I built this. I mean, whatever the things were that, you know, go on in your mind. You know, what's at stake? What, what, what's gonna happen? And I just remember wrestling with that whole idea of, I either am obedient to God and I make this decision and it costs me, or I try to live with my conscience and what I think is disobedience to God in terms of what I need to do as a leader, even if it's unpopular. And I came back to this verse every single day. I can only receive what is given to me from heaven. And John's whole point is, why would I cling to anything? Because God, whatever it is, put it there and God can take it away. And I'm not going to live my life undermining the other parts of my life because I'm trying to preserve, I'm trying to hold on to, I'm trying to cling to with all of my might when a person can only receive what's been given to them from heaven. And John says it this way, he must talking about Jesus become greater. And I must become less. And the one who comes from above is above all. This is talking about Jesus, God. He's at another level. He's beyond all of us. The one who is from the earth belongs to the earth. And John's talking about himself. And I don't know if you know about John in the New Testament. He was the most earthy guy in the world. Um, Not everybody's gonna get this reference, but he's like the Jason Kelsey of Jerusalem in the first century. (laughs) Rather than pounding beers in sub-zero weather, he would, you know, wear animal skins and eat locusts which are our equivalent to roaches. Like that's, I didn't make that up, that's a verse. So John, he was a dude is what I'm trying to say. And so John is like, the one who's from the earth belongs to the earth and speaks as one from the earth. And here's what John is saying. It's been a fun ride. And I've loved the crowds and it's been cool. And everybody knows my name. I even got a nickname. You know, you've arrived if you've got a nickname. I'm John the Baptist. And this, this 15 minutes of fame has been beyond what I can ever imagine, but it's over. And I'm okay with that. And I will not live my life white knuckling, clinging to, trying to get back or hold on to what God placed in my hands in the first place. Because a person can only receive what's been given to them from heaven. Can you imagine living your life that way? Can you imagine with what you're facing right now, with what feels like it's slipping away, with the fact that they're not acknowledging you anymore? Oh, it's so so good three quarters ago, or they they haven't even invited me. Can you imagine living your life this way? And I know the prevailing thought for a lot of you, if you're type A or three on the Enneagram or whatever, your thought is, well, that sounds like I'm gonna be the most passive person in the world and never get anything done. So no, thank you. Can I just say this in love to you? Unlike John the Baptist, Nobody is going to be talking about you in 2,000 years. <laughs> Nobody is going to be writing a message about you in 50 years or me. I mean, everybody's pretty much going to just forget. And if you look at all of the New Testament individuals who lived their lives this way, this wasn't about productivity. This wasn't about achieving. This wasn't about how God has naturally wired them. This is about, I'm going to, in everything I pursue, make sure that I am very clear on who gave it to me, who can take it away. And the reality is for a lot of us, the moment we begin to receive something, we start to live as if we've got to fight to control, to maintain. And God's going, at the end of that day, 
Not only will you sabotage what I have for your life, you'll undermine the very things that I want for you, which is joy and contentment and peace and happiness. This isn't an issue of productivity. God's wired you a certain way. God has a will and desire for you. There's things that God wants you to achieve. There's things that God wants you to go after. But to quote Jesus, what is it worth for a person to gain the whole world as you define it and you forfeit your very self? You forfeit your very soul. This isn't don't achieve, don't go after what God has for you. This is do everything that God has for you, achieve to your maximum potential within the guidelines of what God's will is for your life, but don't trade your soul in the process because it is not worth gaining and achieving and forfeiting the very thing that you want out of life, which is happiness and peace and contentment. It is not a fair trade. And John would go, why would I cling to any of this? Because a man can only receive, a person can only receive what's been given to them from heaven. And that brings us to our, our final safeguard for the soul. Surrender your will, monitor your heart, decide who you are last week. And this week, open your hands. Open your hands in terms of how you live how you view the things in your life, the things that are there, the things that just got put there, the things that are going incredibly well, the things that feel like they are slipping away. Open your hands and keep them open. And I think, and I've tried to give you a prayer almost every week of this series. I, I think it's a prayer that just echoes John the Baptist. And for some of you, you'll, you'll maybe incorporate this. A person can only receive what's been given to them from heaven. This may be weird to you, but I, I, most mornings, I'll just start, and physically, I just open my hands. And I'll just recite that to myself. I'll just remind myself of that. God, it's all yours. And I'm gonna be grateful for everything that you have given me, but I will not cling to what I cannot keep. And here's the thing, man, that I, I kind of teased out in the beginning that you have to remember. What you cling to eventually decreases in value. What you, what you think you need and you gotta preserve so badly eventually decreases in value. But what you make available to other people eventually has the potential to multiply. And here's the thing that is a struggle for all of us. When we feel like something is starting to slip away, our fear of loss ultimately wars against our soul. There is no peace. There is no contentment. There is no joy. It wars against our soul and it wars against our happiness. And we begin when we feel like something is slipping away to actually reorient our priorities to things that in a lot of cases shouldn't be priorities. But we just think we gotta make it happen. We gotta get it back. We gotta preserve it. We gotta make sure that we keep hold of what we feel like we have worked so hard for you. And it wars against our soul. And if you close your hands and live white knuckled in terms of the things of your life, you will actually diminish your capacity for happiness and you'll wither your soul and you won't sleep well at night because you, whether you believe you have one or not, have been created by your creator to live like this because a person can only receive what's been given to them from heaven and we should fear the consequences of closing our hands more than we fear the consequences of losing what is in them because open hands are a reminder it's all you, and it all comes from you. And open-handed living safeguards us against obsessing over what's there rather than who placed it there. One of the things that you've never thought about, maybe sounds really weird to you, is there's really good funerals. I don't know if you've ever been to a really good funeral, but there's really good funerals. And one thing about a really good funeral is what a mentor of mine told me years ago, that in some cases, in some ways, the value of a life is determined by how much of it is given away not how much of it is preserved. And if you have ever been to a great funeral and there are great funerals, nobody ever celebrates what an individual preserved. They celebrate what they gave away. And so I just wanna encourage you, whatever that thing is for your life, and I get it, I'm a type A, get it done, drive. Like I, it has spent me decades of wrestling with God and I have not arrived, but this is something that, man, God has led me to, that has just led me into a level of joy and contentment and peace and happiness that I think is, is beyond what sometimes we can imagine until you really begin to follow Jesus and trust him in this area. I, I'm just opening my hands to everything and I don't have to fear loss. I'm gonna work I was gonna say something else. I'm gonna work hard and I'm gonna trust God with all the consequences. I'm gonna obey God and I'm gonna trust him with all the consequences of my life. So week one, surrender your will to God because the more that you 
begin to orient your life around surrender, it'll sensitize your conscience. It'll make you less tolerant of duplicity. We too monitor your heart, specifically around the areas of guilt and anger and greed and jealousy. Do not settle for what our culture settles for, which is behavioral modification. Be the same person on the inside that you portray on the outside. Last week, come to the place to declare and decide who you are. And the more you obsess over who you are not, you will undermine everything that God has for you in terms of the rhythm of his desire and will for you in regard to who you are, who he's made you to be. And now this week, open your hands and leave them open. Live open-handed because the capacity of your duplicity is determined by the health of your soul. And John, in one of his letters, letters writes this, and I'm gonna end with it, because I think this statement that he, that he begins with is the most perfect way to end this series when he says this in 3 John chapter 1, verse two. I pray that in all respects, you may prosper and be in good health, just as your soul prospers. Solomon said it this way, that out of the heart and soul come all of the issues of life. So pay attention to it. He also said this, above all else, guard your heart, guard your soul, pay attention to it. And I just, my whole hope behind this series is for so many of you, I just want your soul to prosper. I want you to pay attention to what most people just don't pay attention to. And I think more than anything, I want the self that you're living with to actually be the self that you intended to be. And more than that, and more importantly than that, I want the self that you're living with to be the person that God created you to be. So God, I can only receive what is given to me from heaven. I surrender to you. I open my hands. Your will be done in me. Would you guys pray with me? Jesus, I thank you so much for what you're doing in this moment. And Lord, I know that there are so many different thoughts and issues and examples that move to the forefront.